morning and welcome to Lift and Rift Ministries. My name is Patrick Bostito. It's good to have you back as we continue our journey through the book of John this morning. I'm going to grab your Bibles. We're going to jump into it. We're going to get started. We have um, some things we want to discuss today. We're only going to be looking at five verses, but there's a lot of information here to unpack. Um, we're going to be looking at another miracle of Jesus. So if you want to grab your Bibles and we'll pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord. We're thankful for the day that you've given us, Lord, the time that we have together to look at and study your word, Lord, and see who you are. Lord, we're thankful for the, the book that you've given us to tell these accounts of your life, Lord, to tell us of your character, Lord, to show us our way for salvation and eternal life, Lord. And I pray that these lessons are are touching someone, Lord, are are speaking to them or helping them, Lord. I know they're helping me just studying them out, Lord, and I, I just pray that others are reaping the benefit of this study. Lord, I ask that you meet with us. Lord, if, if anyone watching this video does not know you as your Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that, that they see their need for you and they come to you, and we'll thank you for that. Lord, I ask that you just uh, help me to get out of the way, Lord, that they can only see you in the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to be in John, again, chapter 6. And this morning, we're going to be starting in verse 16. And we're going to read 16 through uh, 21 this morning. So let's go ahead and turn to our Bibles, and we'll begin reading. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. So those are our five verses we're looking at this morning um, of this miracle of Jesus walking on the water of John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21. Jesus walking on the water is what I'm calling this portion of the study. So let's read 16 and 17 one more time. It says, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into the ship and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. So why do you think that they left without Jesus? Why do you think they they went about sailing without Jesus? Because it says Jesus was not come to them. Jesus probably wanted some time to be alone, to pray, some time to himself, to get alone with the Father. Um, we see here the disciples are going to the east shore to Capernaum that Um, in verse 19, where we see, well, well, hold on, let me let me back up. 16 and 17, Phil. The disciples, disciples were headed to the east shore of Capernaum, which was about um, six or seven miles uh, from where they were at. So they were rowing six or seven miles on the Sea of Galilee uh, to get to Capernaum. So Jesus wasn't there. He wasn't with them. So they left. So why was it taking Jesus so long? Uh, he waits, presumably, uh, because the crowd had been taking or talking of taking him to Jerusalem to install him as king, to make him king. So he was probably waiting for the crowd to uh, disperse some because it was not his time. Uh, do you think darkness corresponds <clears throat> excuse me, uh, represents anything in this portion of scripture. It says, 
uh, evening was coming, and the disciples went down and it entered into a ship and went over to sea towards Capernaum, and it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. So do you think that darkness represents anything? Uh, darkness is commonly uh, one of John's themes des describing the existence without Christ. Um, we see that all throughout Scripture, that darkness represents life without Christ or uh, a worldly walk instead of a spiritual or biblical walk is darkness. Um, so it's life or existence without Christ and us being on our own. That's darkness. In the darkness away from Christ, the strong wind whipped around them and caused the sea to rise. There was a storm going on because they were in darkness away from Christ. So how do you think the disciples thought Jesus would get to the shore? Um, they left without him. So how do they how do you think they thought he would get there? Um, scripture doesn't tell us how the disciples expected Jesus to eventually catch up to him. Perhaps they thought that he would walk around along the shore uh, since the route they took was within sight of the shore. It was maybe a 10 mile walk. Um, like I said, uh, six or seven, maybe upwards of 10 mile walk. Uh, well, six or seven across the, the sea and 10 probably around. Um, we later learn that there were other small boats at the shore. So perhaps they assumed um, he just wanted some alone time and then he plans to row himself out to meet them. Uh, we learn that later in John chapter 6, verse 22. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 22, the day following when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples went, were entered, and that Jesus was went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. So there might have been other boats there the day before. And now they're seeing no boats there. So perhaps they thought one of the boats that was there when they left, Jesus was going to take and row himself. Real quick, I want to look at Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 45 and 46. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 and 46. Uh, 45 says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, 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 while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into the mountain to pray. So we see he wanted to be alone. He sent them away. He wanted to go and pray. So Jesus sent him. But also, did you notice here that John's account of this is said they're going <coughs> excuse me, to Capernaum and Mark is saying Bethsaida. Uh, Mark's gospel says they were returning to Bethsaida which is where John says Jesus fed the multitude. So you might wonder, are they leaving the city or are they returning to? It might be a little confusing, but there's no contradictions in the Bible. So as it turns out, there are two Bethsaidas around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the word Bethsaida means fish town. Um, so it's not surprising that there would be probably be multiple places around this place called Fishtown. Uh, they were leaving Bethsaida Julius and returning to a Bethsaida, which was part of a larger Capernaum. So it's not a contradiction. It's just different parts. You know, I live in 
or used to live in Wheeling, West Virginia. I live in Martin's Ferry now. Wheeling was broken up into different parts as well. You have uh, the city of Wheeling itself, and you have North Wheeling, you have South Wheeling, you have East Wheeling, and you even have West Wheeling. And West Wheeling is actually across the river in Ohio. It's not even in West Virginia. So you see, it's not uncommon for things like this to happen, uh, to actually have different uh, places called the same thing. Um, we see that with our cities here in the United States. Um, it, states, multiple states have some of the same city names, so to speak. So it's not something that should be uh, truly looked at as a contradiction because it happens in our country as well. Notice also that in Mark, Jesus tells them goodbye and then left. Do you think the disciples wondered why Jesus sent them away? Do you think they wondered that? Look at John chapter 6 and verse eight, eight, or 18. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. They were at the Sea of Galilee, and they call it the Sea of Galilee. It's actually the largest lake in Israel, um, 13 miles by 8 miles. It is the lowest lake in the world, about 700 feet under sea level. Um, it sits surrounded by mountains. Because it is surrounded by mountains, there are often storms and high waves. and on that night, they were especially strong, rowing, taking longer than sailing, and it goes especially slow when the wind is against you and the waves. So this huge lake they call the Sea of Galilee uh, is um, common to have these storms and the winds blowing around and these high, treacherous waves, and they're rowing you know, six or seven miles uh, to the eastern coast against waves, against the wind. Um, it's taking longer than normal. And then 19 and 20 we see, but he saith unto them, it is I. Well, 19 again. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking into the sea and drawing nigh Unto the ship. So we see they rode about three or four miles. It's about halfway there to Capernaum, um, is what they went. Five and 20 or 30 furlongs is about six, or uh, about three or four and a half miles is where they went. So they, they got halfway to where they were going. They see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. So do you think the disciples were afraid of the storm? Uh, there's no indication that they were afraid of the storm itself. You know, John and them were fishermen, so they were probably out in rough waters fishing times past. Um, so maybe not the storm itself, but they were troubled by their inability to move ahead. In fact, Matthew tells us that Jesus approached them in the fourth watch of the night, uh, which is about 3 to 6 a.m. So these men had been at work rowing for at least six to seven hours for a trip that should have taken less than half of that time. That's how horrible and hard this storm was. Um, and they were still not at the shore yet. Uh, they were only about halfway the, there. As yet, John adds that they rode about three or four and a half miles at, by this point, which places them halfway to their destination. Mark's gospel says that they were in the middle of the sea, but the Greek word can also be trans translated mist of the sea, in other words, they are still too far from land to get out of the boat. So 
another three and a half, four miles perhaps from land on the other side. And then 19 and 20, which we read. Um, why do you think Jesus was walking on the water? That's an interesting question. Why do you think Jesus was walking on the water? And would you like to walk on water? How about during a storm? Would you want to work on the water? Remember the account of, of John walking on the water. John walked on water. Um, or Peter. Peter. We give Peter a hard time because Peter is always putting his foot in his mouth. Peter is always gung-ho about stuff and ends up saying something that he ends up regretting or, or comes back to bite some, so to speak. And, you know, Jesus bid him, or they seen Jesus walking, they thought he was a ghost, and uh, Peter says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come out there to you. And Jesus said, come. Peter stepped out the boat and walked on water. And it wasn't until he took his eyes off Jesus that he started to sink. He took his eyes off Jesus and started looking around at the storm and the waves and the things of this world and began to sink away from our Savior. You know, we give Peter a hard time, like I said, because of the stupid stuff he says, but he had enough faith to step out on the water. So that the, the moral of that account isn't just to keep our eyes on Jesus. It's that when we have faith in Jesus, we can do the impossible. You see, in our mind, walking on water is impossible. Jesus made that possible to show that he can do all things and we can do all things through him if we have faith and trust in him. So would you like to walk on water? You know, I think about that sometimes and and I think it would be interesting. But what about during a storm? You know, I have family that grew up near Virginia Beach and we used to go there for the summers. And I remember the summer, the one summer we went, there was a hurricane. And I remember um, going to the beach. Uh, the hurricane was still a while away. Um, and we just went to look at the beach because I've never seen like the ocean or anything during a hurricane. And my uncle Mike, who um, has seen quite a few growing up in in uh, the Virginia Beach area um, is was is also in the Air Force. So he was at a uh, a base which was by there. It's the Air Force and Navy Navy base near Virginia Beach, and so he's seen storms like this before. So we went to the beach. He drove me to take me, and and we just kind of we got out the car uh, and went to the beach. We didn't go to the water's edge because. Even though the storm was still a while away, man, those waves were high. Those waves were crashing in. I was scared to get too close to the water because of that. So I, I didn't want to go too close, but I wouldn't want to walk on the sea with those high waves and, and those winds because I seen what it was like when the storm wasn't even there yet. Um, I, I can't imagine what it would be like with the storm there. I've seen it on TV and the news. But I wouldn't want to walk in wa on, on the water in those circumstances. So Jesus was showing us there in that account that if we keep his our eyes on him, focused on him, it does not matter about the storms of life. He will keep us safe. He will keep us afloat. He will keep us on top of the water, on top of the waves, on top of the storm. Look at Mark again, uh, chapter 6, verses 47 through 50. It says, And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them trolling and rowing, toiling and rolling, rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and was about the fourth watch of the night. He cometh unto them, walking on the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. 
For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Why do you think Jesus was intending to walk past him? If we look there, it said, uh, walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. Um, why do you think Jesus would was intending to pass them by? Uh, perhaps, perhaps he didn't want to frighten them or scare them. He knew what their reaction would be. Um, whose reaction wouldn't be that way if they see someone walking on the water. But the thing that's different about the disciples, they've been spending this time with Jesus. They've been seeing him do all these miracles. Um, but yet they limited what they thought he can do at that moment. Look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 27. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And then Matthew 14, 28 and 29 says this, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me come unto thee onto the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So we talked about that a little bit ago. Would you have wanted to walk on water too? Uh, do you, did, did any of the other disciples ask to walk on water? And why do you think Peter asked to walk on the water too? He wanted to uh, confirm his faith. He knew that if this truly was Jesus, he would be able to do this as well. Peter had a faith that we don't have. Yeah, he messes up sometimes. He's human. He says some stupid things. But Peter had a faith that we didn't we don't have. Uh, Matthew 14, 30 and 32 or through 32 says this, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he crieth, cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So why was Peter afraid when he had his eyes on Jesus? He was not. When did Peter become afraid? When he took his eyes off Jesus and he started looking at the storm of the world. Um, so what was the miracle that Jesus just did before walking on the water is when he fed the multitude, the over 5,000. So what is the bigger miracle, feeding people or walking on water? What do you think the biggest one is? They are both pretty amazing. But I wonder why they were not as amazed with the feeding of the 5,000 as they were walking on water. Think about what they did. They took those five loaves and those two fish, and over 5,000 people were able to eat until they were satisfied and then still had 12 baskets of leftovers. But they weren't as amazed by that as they were about him walking on water. I wonder why. Both of those miracles relate to uh, the Exodus, back in Exodus. God provided the bread and controlled the elements when he parted the Red Sea. So that's looking back at, at Exodus and, and the people coming from Egypt. You know, he parted the Red Sea for them to walk on dry land and then prevented, provided them manna. Excuse me, bread from heaven so that they could be their physical needs will be provided for, just as he provided bread for the over 5,000. Uh, Jesus requires us, or rescues us, as God rescued the Israelites from Pharaoh when they crossed the Red Sea. We all need to be rescued. He reaches out to us. Uh, we all need to respond to him by taking his hand. You know, Peter walking on water and then looking at the storm and sinking is 
kind of a picture of us in our lost state. We follow the world. We are worried by the world. We're sinking in the storms of life. All we have to do is simply call out for the Lord to save me. And what's the scripture say there is Jesus immediately stretched forth his hand and pulled him out. Jesus does that for us. When we call out to him and we truly believe in our hearts and repent, we are immediately saved. We're immediately pulled out of the mire the muck, the clay, the seas, seas and storms of life were immediately rescued. All we have to do is keep obeying, keep our eyes on Jesus, and we'll avoid further storms. But we're human beings, and we mess up. The Bible says that a just man falleth seven times, but get it up again, get, getteth up again. Now that doesn't give us an excuse to mess up. It's not saying it's okay, it doesn't matter. It's saying that a just man is still going to fall because we're human. But we get up again and we, we come back to the, the Father. We repent. We ask for help and guidance from God. You know, God will direct our paths. Go to Mark chapter 6 again, and we're going to look at uh, verses 50 through 52. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. What was the significance of the miracle of the loaves? Think about that. What is the significance of that miracle? Well, what is Jesus called? The bread of life. So that corresponds to Jesus being the bread of life and supplying our needs. Why is the bread so important? Because we would all die if we don't eat. You know, if we don't eat, starvation's going to happen. We're going to die. Would you die without Jesus? Well, death is going to happen. Ten out of ten people die. Um, you know, they're comes a time, unless Jesus comes back before, but there comes a time when our body's going to give up and, you know, old age or, or anything else can happen to us and we're going to end up dying, um, either by old age or an accident or something like that. Ten out of ten people are set to die. So, would you die without Jesus? Jesus is what makes us alive. We're already dead. So that question of would we die without Jesus, is it, I'm really asking for you to think. Because we're already dead spiritually. But that death, that dying without Jesus, what I'm talking about, if we have Jesus, we're not going to die in the sense of having complete and total separation from God. No one will get eternal life without Jesus. That being with him forever, without Jesus, we're not going to have that. Without that, we're going to spend eternity separated from God, which is basically what death means. How might we explain what's happening to allow Jesus to walk on the water? Uh, in Genesis 1, we're told that in the beginning, the Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters in total darkness. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form. And darkness was upon the face of the earth. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, 
and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. So the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters in total darkness. And earlier in John's Gospel, we were told that Jesus was the Word who created all things in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is the significance of saying, I am here? I am. I am. As the name God... I am is the name God used to reveal who he was to Moses. It is part of that phrase that will be increasingly used by John. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. Those are only a few of the I am statements in John. Now, John records the words I am more than any other book of the Bible. As we talked about in the beginning, you know, God or John talks about the deity or the uh, Jesus being God. That's its correlation. That's what it points out and shows. What is the significance of do not be afraid? Out of the storm comes the confirming word words that God is here. Do not be afraid. This is also a promise of God, meaning we have freedom from fear as our Lord is our partner in life and faith. You know, Jesus should be leading our life. You know, driving around, I've seen, uh, I've seen bumper stickers and stuff that says Jesus is my co-pilot and and uh, that song, Jesus, Take the Wheel, um, meaning they're giving Jesus control when they're in trouble. I have problems with that because Jesus should be the pilot, not the co-pilot. What we're saying when we say Jesus is my co-pilot is, I got this. And then when I don't, you can take over. You see, Jesus should be the captain of our ship. He should be our pilot. He should be leading us in every situation. Jesus knows what's best for us. You know, our pastor has been preaching out of Proverbs chapter 16 lately, and Proverbs 16 is all about pride. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, has a lot of the same um, themes in the verses saying, Uh, every man thinketh that, or every man thinks that his own way is right. In other words, I'm going to paraphrase, but you know, uh, doing what's right in our own eyes. Our own eyes think our way is right. That's what's problem with us as human beings. Our pride swells up and makes us to think that our way is better than everybody else's. But God's way is better. Even if our way is good, it may not be God's great. You know, I've said that before. God wants what's best for us, not just what's good for us. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 21. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. So how did they arrive immediately? You know, it says immediately they were there. Remember, when this happened, they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They were only halfway to where they were going. But when they received Jesus into the boat, they immediately were at their destination. So how did they arrive that way? As Jesus can do whatever he wants. Jesus is not set by our rules here on earth. He's not set by our time and gravity. He can do anything. He is God. And a lot of problems that we have in our lives, um, we try to 
compartment compartmentalize who God is. We try to fit him into our brain and our mind. And God's just way too big for that. As a matter of fact, if I can take God and put him in my head and I can understand everything about him and, and know how and why he does everything, that's not a God worth serving. That's not a God that should be served or worshipped. That would be a God that is no better than us if we knew and can think everything about him. God is way bigger than our thoughts and our imaginations. God is above time and gravity. He created it. He's above it. It doesn't work on him as it does for us, in other words. Uh, is arriving immediately a bigger miracle than the bread and walking on water? I don't think it is. I did, they all coincide on who Jesus is. They all uh, give us a picture of who Jesus is. So I have some questions, and we're going to be finished. Uh, how do you respond to difficult, difficult hardships? Um, do you tuck tail and run? Do you face them head on in macho, macho pride? Or do you call out to Christ for him to help? Do you call out for God on what you should do? You know, maybe God wants you to move away from that hardship. And maybe he wants you to face it head on. But our response should be to ask God for guidance. What do you do when the storms of life come upon you? Do we cry? Do we whine? Do we bellyache? Or do we still praise God in the storms that we know he is God? We know he has us. We know that he is going to get us through. What are some tests of faith that you have had? And how did you react in them? How have these experiences helped you grow in faith? How has Jesus rescued you in the past? Think about your salvation if you're saved. From what do you think you need God to rescue from today? Is there anything that, that you have in your life that maybe um, God is showing you in your life that you need rescued from? Let me tell you, when I taught RU and when we did RU, we learned and we taught, and it's true, just as true today as it was then, that Anything we do on our own, we're going to fail. at. We're going to fail. We can't turn over a good leaf enough to get away from that. So what do you think you need God to rescue from today? In what ways did you fail to recognize that Jesus was there in a time of your stress? Did you have any of those times when, when you didn't rely on Jesus? How can seeing what Christ did for you in the past help you trust him more in the future? I'm going to change that from a question to a statement and say it this way. Seeing what Christ did for you in the past can help you trust him more in the future. You know, Jesus, God, are the same today that they were yesterday. They're going to be the same tomorrow as they are today and yesterday. They don't change. They are who they are. They keep their promises and they keep their word. They're going to continue to do what they promised to do. Um, and they love us and they care about us. So what's keeping you from trusting them? What's keeping you from Handing over whatever situation it is to God. It's pride. It all boils down to pride, as our pastor has been talking about and uh, uh, preaching about lately. It all stems from pride. You want to get to the rubber meets the road or get to the bottom of it. Pride is at the root of it. 
You can't fix something unless you get to the root of the issue, and it's pride. And we can do nothing about our pride, but God can help us with that. We need to cry out like the psalmist did to search me, O Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me. And we know there is because Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows our heart. God can help us clean our heart. If we rest, if we focus, rest, and yield to him. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord. We're thankful for this this study, Lord. We're thankful for the time that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for these truths that we've learned in your word. Lord, and, and I pray that you go through us, with us throughout the rest of the day. Help to keep these scriptures on our minds of what you can do and what you want to do for us. Lord, that you want to help us to walk on water in the storms of our lives. You want to help us and you want to pull us out of there. We just need to yield to you. Lord, I pray that anyone who does not know that of you, Lord, uh, specifically anyone who does not know you as Lord and Savior is not saved, Lord, within the sound of this video or or uh, just in life in general, Lord, that they would reach out for you. Call out like Peter did, Lord, to save them. And your word tells us immediately that you will. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you've done. And we're already thanking you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining. Come back tomorrow as we dive into uh, chapter 6 some more. Make sure to check out Blessed with Truth Ministries for more Bible studies. Uh, check out our, our YouTube page um, with the videos and stuff on there. And then check out our uh web page at bless or uh lift in a rift ministries dot weebly dot com you'll see information about us I'll, I'll post uh the link in the comments there for it um on the video that you can get to our website and you can hear preaching and you can hear bible studies and you can just see what we're doing in this work and may you be blessed with truth today <music>